we started today with 50 years of Title IX, right? And we're going to end with 50 years of sports law. Um, for those of you who don't know, Professor Marty Greenberg has taught at this law school for 50 years as of this fall. Um, taught sports law for, I think, 44 of those years, but taught in the law school for 50 years, and this will be the last semester that he'll be teaching. And Well, he'll be teaching a full course. He'll still be teaching. Um, and I had asked him when we were putting this conference together, how about a 50-year perspective from his perspective of developments in sports law? So that's what we'll start with before we get to some other things after. So, Marty. I'm actually embarrassed to admit that I have been here for 50 years because my wife told me when I walked out of the house tonight that I looked like I was 25. <laughs> 50 years have gone by. Time is free, but it is priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you'll never get it back. I have spent 50 years at Marquette University Law School attempting to light up bright minds and utilize learning to transform mirrors into windows. When I was a kid many years ago, we played the game for the love of the game. We viewed sports as a competitive and cooperative display of skills. That's changed today. Sport has transformed into a business characterized by waning loyalty to home fans and hometowns, but the money ball continues to roll. When I started this journey, the athletes of the days and the iconic superstars were not free. They were subject to a historic feudal system and considered chattels. The team had all the leverage. The player was strictly team property. Unless the team chose to trade or release him, the player's first big league team would be the only big league team that he ever played for. But there was a challenge to gain freedom, a challenge to the reserve clause in baseball and the Roselle rule in football, and it was short in coming. Kurt Flood in 1969, followed by arbitration's decision in 1975 by Messerschmitt at McNally, opened free agency in Major League Baseball. The Roselle rule in Mackey versus NFL was also found to be an unfair restraint of trade. So free, our players are free. Freedom gave rise to unionization, which also involved strikes and lockouts, and unionization gave rise to collective bargaining. Collective bargaining gave athletes a seat of the table to help to form and put the infrastructure together as to the sport that they played in. And that document, the Bible of each of these leagues, talks about revenue sharing, salary caps, athletic discipline, rules for transfer trades, safety standard, injury agreements, and health and retirement benefits. Free agency along with revenue sources such as media, internationalization, gambling, as long as some of those monies go to the public to help pay for stadiums, inflation, and sports agents have had a dramatic effect on the wealth of today's athletes. In 1989, when we started this, the average salary in Major League Baseball was $488,000. Oral Hershiser and Cal Ripken were the big time players at that point, earning about $2.5 million. 
As I stand here today, the average salary for Major League Baseball players is $4.4 million. With Max Serger earning $43 million, Corey Seager $37.5 million, the whole nature of the monetary structure of sports has changed. And this is not the sole test of success. The advent of long-term, enormous contract packages. Mike Trout, $426 million over 12 years. Mookie Betts, $365 million over 12 years. 396 major leaguers are millionaires, or approximately 31.4% of all players. And what do these contracts mean? They're guaranteed contracts. I wish to God I would have gotten a guaranteed contract when I got out of law school from the law firm that I first worked for. A guaranteed contract in sports is you get paid whether or not you can play the game, whether or not you get injured, and whether or not you're alive. In 1960, the Consumer Price Index has seen an eight-fold increase. The salaries paid to Major League Baseball players have seen a 500-fold increase. But that's not all. Our sports heroes, our role models, make a lot of money and create major brand advertising platforms and in many instances, endorsements are greater than the salary package. We'll take LeBron James, for instance. He's made over $55 million in his endorsements, and it is projected that through his lifetime, he will make somewhere in the area of a billion dollars from Nike. Can't cry for Aaron Rodgers. He's accumulated over $200 million in wealth, just behind Tom Brady at $250 million. Yes, the economic climate has dramatically changed for athletes today. But also, there has been a dramatic change in ownership. Today, to join the club, you got to be a billionaire. It's a billionaire's ball game. Steve Ballmer, Dan Gilbert, Stan Krenke, Philip Anschutz, David Tepper, Rob Walton, Steve Cohn, and I can go on and on and on. It's not a millionaire anymore. The old-time families, like the Maras, the Roonies, and the Hallises, and more recently, the Busts, the Crafts, the Steinbrenners, and the Glazers, families that own sports franchises. Not the case anymore. It's hedge fund entrepreneurs, such as Mark Lasry, John Henry, and Josh Harris. It's investment managers, people who manufacture money. It's com tech company executives and real estate developers who see the upside of sports facility development and the tax havens that professional sports produces. Yes, it has truly become a game of billionaires. Latest Forbes estimation of value for Wisconsin teams bears out my point. The Brewers, 1.8 billion. Packers, 4.25 billion. Milwaukee Bucks, 1.9 billion. The owners of those teams have estimated net worth from 700 million to 5.4 billion. Recently, the Denver Broncos sold highest price ever paid for an American franchise to Rob Walton, Walmart fame, for $4.65 billion. These numbers are astronomical and far from what I started with in 1989 or when I came here in the 70s. 
In 1906, the forerunner of the NCA was founded. It was a nonprofit institution whose focus was on amateurism as the core foundation for college sports. In 1916, the NCA actually had a definition of amateurism. An athlete that played their sport purely for enjoyment and for developing their mental, physical, moral, and social skills. That's a joke. That has dramatically changed. O'Bannon was an image rights case that ultimately settled for 60 million, but more importantly, morphed into a class action antitrust challenge of the entire NCA amateur model. The court found that the NCA put a salary cap on student athletes in the form of a scholarship and found that the NCA was violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. Where some of the rules were very pro-competitive, the NCA was not exempt from antitrust scrutiny. So applying the rule of reason, the court concluded that the NCA was in violation of antitrust law and must provide athletes with scholarships up to the full cost of attendance beyond tuition, room, board, and books. Now this past July, 2022, marked the first anniversary of college athletes being able to monetize their name, image, and likeness. You know it probably from today as NIL. Every other person in America is allowed to do the same without regulation or restriction. College athletics was all about the love of the game, but what was happening in the meantime, colleges were turning profits on a multi-billion dollar basis, almost $19 billion per year. Finally, College athletes can accept money for commercial endorsements, appearances, social media posts, writing books, hosting camps, giving lessons, all commercial activities without being in violation of NCA rules. And the NCA says, fine, that's fine, as long as this is not for pay for play. Today you spent a good part of the day listening to people about the Title IX 50th anniversary and what it has done for females in sports. There's not much more I can say than it has changed the face of sport and the recreation industries, and congratulations to that. Transfer rules. Stuck with the school. You want to get out for a better education or a better opportunity, you got to sit. Sit for a year. Student athletes now have free agency. They can go into the transfer portal and transfer once without having to sit out. 6,475 undergraduate athletes transferred in 2021. I went to the University of Wisconsin, followed football, understood the Big Ten to be geographic because everybody who played it was within a geographic area that was close by. Realignment is essentially the free agency that universities are now experiencing. USC and UCLA in the Big Ten, if you would have told me that, when I went to the University of Wisconsin, I would have thought you were nuts. 
Changes in NCA conference membership. Division I level, FBS. Of the 10 FBS conferences, seven have undergone changes in membership. Abuse. Finally, after all these years, it has now come out in the courtroom and press. I know, because in the last five years, I've handled 20 of those cases, starting with Penn State. I informed the NCAA some years ago that this was a much greater problem than you were given credence to. And if you asked me five years ago, what is abuse, I would have probably told you that it's something that my grandson was suffering from in his school, but I didn't really know what it is. I now know what it is. Homophobic or racial slurs, embarrassing athletes in front of peers, threatening loss of scholarship, forcing play when injured, demeaning statements, physical activity like slapping, grabbing, hitting, exclusion from peer groups, retaliation, bullying, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, and violence. And I've seen all of these in the last five years. I even have seen student athletes close to suicide because of these activities. Now, while the NCA may not be raising its hand and asking for change, I am. And I handle these cases to embarrass the university that tries to hide this under the carpet. Abuse, termination for cause, you're gone. Anybody accused of abuse, put on leave. The investigations, not by the university, the athletic director, the HR department, or the law firm that represents the university. Outside, somebody who basically is objective. Buyouts. Okay, you're an abuser, but we don't want to get sued. We don't want to hang that dirty laundry out in the public. So we'll give you some money and we'll call it termination for not cause. Unacceptable. It's not only the coaches, it's the administrators who are complicit in this action. Whistleblowing needs to be encouraged. The goal is zero tolerance. College coaches, one time, were long term, very much committed to their universities seldom changed jobs, this has changed. Contracts are broken as easily they are made. This has become known as the coaching carousel or jumping coaches. I mean, look, who would ever leave Notre Dame? Notre Dame is like God, right? Kelly did jumped to LSU for $95 million for 10 years, all guaranteed. This has become an athletic director's nightmare. Firing for making a mistake, something that I know about because I've served as an expert witness in many of these cases. How in the world can colleges pay millions of dollars for coaches that they hired improperly in the first place. Paul Christ, 67 and 26, 67 wins, 26 losses. Recently fired not for cause. $20 million left on that contract. He settled for 11. But I ask myself the question, isn't there a better use 
for that $11 million than paying a truly fired coach? I keep on thinking back to the days when we started here, and I was growing up, it was Milwaukee County Stadium, the home of the Green Bay Packers and the Milwaukee Braves. That stadium opened in 1953, was of Tinker Toy Variety construction, cost a total of $5.9 million. It was paid for from the general fund from real estate tax collections and featured a chalet and giant beer mug where Bernie the Brewer or whatever he was called at that time did his things. This is one of the most dramatic changes in all of sports. A redefinition of what a state-of-the-art facility is. A place where people want to go because they want the experience and want to spend their hard-earned dollars. What do I see as the stadium today much different than what I saw in 1953, preferred seating, points of sales, a technology fortress, a design revolution, a venue for all seasons, a name to call home, corporate sponsorships, all at a very big price tag, now in the billions of dollars. And of course, we ask ourselves, what gave impetus to this? Tax Reform Act, tax-exempt bonds. Lots of law cases that indicate that monies, public monies, that go to construction for stadiums are in the public interest and serve a public purpose. Stadium mania. What does it mean to owners? And this is why it is so important today to have a state-of-the-art facility. Number one, it means more revenues, which equals more profits. Number two, the way these deals are structured, where basically the tenant, the team, has management control of the facility for a long term, 20 to 30 years, absolutely increases the capitalized value of that team. That's the difference today between what I realized when I started here and what we're seeing the sale of some of these. About 60% of the teams in football and baseball had new stadiums since 2010. About 60% of the monies that go to construct these facilities are your hard-earned tax dollars. Approximately $6. billion has been spent by the public on sports facilities since 1997. And now, they all have names. The name is the game. Staples, SoFi, Barclay pay millions of dollars to put their impression on these facilities. This became such an interesting topic that we actually went on the road. Remember that, Paul? Los Angeles. We had conferences for four or five years about sports facility development. In fact, I am proud to tell you that Marquette Law School was the very first law school in the country that had a course in sports facility development. So what is sports facility development? In very simple terms, it is nothing more than real estate development. This stadium, arena, is more than a place to see a sporting event, a destination place, an entertainment district, a real estate development, a place where people can work, eat, watch, congregate, recreate, buy, and socialize. Did an expert witness 
gig out in San Francisco some years ago. Went to look at the stadiums there as they were being built. Nothing around them. Came back again for another gig. I couldn't believe what I saw. Apartments, stores, people congregating on top of these facilities. And it's good. It's all good. Because normally what happens is these stadiums are responsible for revitalization of blighted areas, environmentally tainted areas, aged communities, and town, downtown areas. You know them. Battery in Atlanta, Ballpark Village in St. Louis. You didn't even know them in Wisconsin. Title Town in Green Bay, your district here, and soon to be an entertainment district for the Brewers at the stadium. Now, I, I can't emphasize enough how important these buildings are. In 2016, Stan Krenke, who is a resident from Missouri and who was the owner of the St. Louis Rams, who had relocated on a number of occasions, attempted to move, relocate his team to Los Angeles because the owner of the facility did not comply with the lease, was not bringing the standard of the facility up to 25% of what other facilities had at the time. So he relocated. And what he did astonishes me from a historical perspective. He spent $5.5 billion on building a beautiful stadium. He privately financed the entire sports facility. It is home to two teams, the Rams and the Chargers. SoFi gave him $625 million to put its name. But most important, and if he was standing here today, I think he would admit to you that the carrot of that deal was 200 and 90 acres of property in Inglewood, near Los Angeles, to develop because Stan Krenke is a real estate developer. So I'd like to tell you a little historical story about this institute. In the 80s, Rick Majerus was my best friend. I had a tremendous interest in uh, Marquette basketball, my wife and I were probably the top recruiters of basketball players for Marquette. What we were doing was probably illegal uh, based on NCAA rules, but uh, nobody has ever caught up with me. So in the 80s, I, I was teaching a course in personal service contracts, which I think now they call representing professional athletes and coaches. That was really a good course. It was a contract course. It was legally substantive. But the faculty would not let me call it sports law. So I had to call it personal service contracts. The idea of the National Sports Law Institute was not a well-received concept at its exception. The complaints that we heard is there is no such thing as sports law. Sports law would be demeaning to Marquette University and its academic integrity. Sports Law Institute would detract from other areas of the law at Marquette. That's what I was up against. But I had three mentors and three people who believed in my vision, besides my wife. Dean Frank DeGeer, Professor James Giardi, and Dean Charles Minkowski, 
saw that this was something that would be good for Marquette. With all the complaints, money carries a big stick. We raised $500,000 to get this started from the generosity of the Brewers, the Bucks, the Packers, Admirals, Mrs. Pettit, and Miller Brewery. In 1989, Frank DeGeer announced publicly that Marquette University Law School had formed the National Sports Law Institute. Now, when it started, it was somewhat meager. A couple of courses, Master of the Game Award, business luncheons, and the creatus and the creation of the longest standing law review in sports in the country. This area of the law has become recognized at every law school, and every law school has followed the lead of Marquette University. This is unbelievable. 13 faculty members, 16 courses and workshops, an ability to obtain a sports law certificate an ability to obtain combined degrees, lots of national and local internships, and an opportunity to be part of that law review. So the dream that I had has metamorphosed into the leading sports law program in the country. What's interesting is, is when I went to law school here, I think I graduated in 1971. Most of the students were from Milwaukee or Wisconsin. That has dramatically changed. And the reason it has changed is the Sports Law Institute. We have students coming from cities, states, and countries all over the world to Marquette University to matriculate in this particular area of the law. I am so very, very proud of what has been accomplished here. So I've told you some things that have changed. What hasn't changed is me. I have a certain philosophy, a philosophy that I have used with my students for over 50 years, like it or not, and I want to share some of that with you. Sift and winnow for the truth. Learning is living. No holds barred. Everything is fair game. Take knowledge and put it to a practical use. If you haven't experienced, how can you then teach it? This one may not be very popular. Teachers should be graded, not students. I've demanded the very best you can do, which is better than anyone else has done. No, absolutely no, is not an answer. Failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay, not defeat. It is a temporary detour, not a dead end. Failure is something we can avoid only by saying nothing doing nothing, being nothing, this is what's guided me in the 50 years that I have been teaching here. And most important, differences make all the difference. There are certain thank yous in order. Frank DeGeer, Dean Charles Minkowski, and Professor James Giardi saw the vision, fought the battle, and made certain that the NSLI became part of the Marquette family. I told you that we raised $500,000. First in, Bud Selig, Bob Harlan, who saw the vision, as well as the need for sports law education. Herb Cole, Joe Tierney, Miller Brewery, James Pettit, were all responsible.
for underwriting the National Sports Law Institute. Jim Gray, thank you so much for all of the contributions you made at the very beginning and for being able to put up with me all those years. <laughs> I've never counted the number of students that I had, but I presume they're in the thousands now. I want to thank them, whether they're here or not here, for coming to Marquette, believing in this program, matriculating and giving credence to the area of sports law. Marquette, as a result of this, I believe, has come to become a national law school because of this institute. Now, I had the idea, you know, a little bit nuts, faculty thought I was a little bit nuts, but it's not me who has made this a success. I dreamt and the dream came true. It's Matt Mitten, Paul Anderson, and Dean Joe Kearney who have taken the National Sports Law Institute to the next step. Vince Lombardi once said, perfection is not attainable, but if you chase perfection, we can obtain excellence. Matt, Paul, and Joe have brought excellence to Marquette University Law School. Finally, my wife, Bev, who is here today with my daughter and my legal assistant, Danelle. This would not have been possible. None of this would have happened without her fervent trust in my crazed vision and whose gentle hand and brilliant mind pushed me ever forward whenever I felt discouraged. It's not me, it's not me who should be honored by Marquette. It is me who should be honoring Marquette for taking me, saying that I had a vision, and for making that vision come true. So I say to you, thank you, Marquette. You have been my life. I have appreciated the very moment that I was asked to be a professor here. And all I can say is, very simply, be the difference. And thank you, Marquette.